Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Yonit Behar, and I'm the assistant curator at the Paul Art Museum. It's really wonderful to see you all here today. Today's program is in conjunction with our current exhibition, Latinx American, which includes 38 Latinx artists from Chicago and beyond. To accompany this exhibition, we have planned a number of programs to expand, explore, and examine the notion of Latinx art. I want to take this opportunity to invite you all to our next program on April 21st, called Seeing Family in Latinx Art, a conversation with Diana Solis, Nicole Marroquin, and Diana Ledesma, where the three panelists will explore questions such as how have issues of race, class, nationality, and sexuality shaped how Latinx artists visualize the family. You can find more information about this program on our website. I am thrilled to present today's program, Pablo Elguera, Unrequited Chicago Works in conversation with Daniel Quiles. This is a dream program really to have Pablo Elguera join us someone that I've been following and admiring since I, since I first landed in the US. I've heard of Pablo during my first internship in the arts in New York for an organization called No Longer Empty, where Pablo had a project called Dictator Game, a participatory game that I won't get into now, but really showed me Pablo's talent, his sharpness and humor that was truly compelling. Today, Pablo Elguera will present two works connected, connected to his relationship with Chicago, where he lived from a, for a formative decade, attending art school and initiating his artistic career. He will launch his video work, Evanston 1989, and will read from his 2008 novel, The Boy Inside the Letter, which is based on his art school diaries and documenting his first years as an immigrant and a young artist on the verge of early adulthood. Pablo Alguera is a Mexican artist living in New York. His work involves performance, drawing, installation, theater, and other literary strategies. He is the recipient of international grants and awards, and he is often considered a pioneering figure in the field of social engaged art. He is the author of many books, including Education for Social Engaged Art and the Parable Conference. He is currently Assistant Professor of Arts Management and Entrepreneurship at the College of the Performing Arts at the New School. He writes a weekly column titled Beautiful Ex Eccentrics. Pablo Alguera will be in conversation with the brilliant Daniel Quiles, Associate Professor of Art History, Theory, and Criticism at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he teaches courses on the theory and history of post-war art of the Americas. His research has focused on Argentinian conceptualism and video, including a book-length interview with artist Jaime Davidovic. Recent publications include contributions to the Pacific Standard Time retrospective, David Lamela's A Life of Their Own, the Fundación Espiga's book, Benedict Works 1968 to 1978, and Candida Alvarez, Here, A Reader, as well as many other publications. We will have time for your questions at the end of the program, so please feel free to enter them in the chat box um, at the time of the Q&A. Thank you so much to Pablo and Daniel and to all of you for joining us today. And now I will turn it to Pablo. Thank you. Thank you, Yonit. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And thank you, Daniel, for uh, also um, being in conversation. I really look forward to, to that exchange. Uh, and I really, um, it's really special to me to be able to, to talk to you today and speak specifically about these uh, works that relate to my formative years in Chicago. Um, so what I'm going to do is three things. I first, first will speak a little bit about uh, my uh, life story uh, as a student in Chicago, uh, the work that I developed then, um, how that led to um, how how these ideas eventually lead to this project of the boy inside the letter many years later, the novel about my those years, and and then I will present uh, a, a video that you need mentioned earlier that uh, is in a certain way a uh, 
follow up uh, an addendum, an appendix uh, to those earlier projects. So with that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. My, my um, I guess one thing to say just quickly, my, my background in um, when growing up in Mexico City, when I arrived to Chicago, um, was already very complex. I come from a family of musicians, uh, classical musicians, uh, and also writers. And uh, however, I um, I will gravitate towards the visual arts. And from the beginning, I I had these uh, complicated um, um, uh, wishes to to merge all these things together. But I did not know how to do that. So a lot of my work uh, in, invoked theater and invoked music. Uh, in an illustrative way, perhaps. Um, and uh, those early years in uh, in Chicago, in art school, when I entered, when I arrived to the School of the Institute of Chicago in 1989, um, were uh, marked by my trying to um, to formulate ways in which uh, those things could merge. Um, what happens, I think, what, what I learned later is that when one starts developing these projects as, as, as a young adult or as an art student you never know uh, what are the things that will eventually connect with your uh with with uh, your uh, um more like more developed work later uh this was a, for example a an artist book that i made uh all this stuff is from my student years this was called america it was kind of like a book that would open into an installation and I was really obsessed with the whole notion of America as, as a continent. What is really interesting, and I had never thought about it, like many years later, uh, this obsession does become an, a functioning um, portable schoolhouse that traveled from Alaska to Chile uh, called the School of Pan-American Unrest. So that's the, uh, that's, it, it's interesting how these ideas eventually take shape. Um, same thing with my uh, work as a visual artist. I was making this collage practice. I was making works with small uh, postcards. And that indeed became um, a kind of work that I still to this day produce. Uh, this is part of the Arlington Heights suite. Every night I make collages um, by using um, old books and scrapbooks and, and, um, and, and other materials. And uh, I have so far produced around 13,000 of these collages uh, with the hopes that one day all of them will be exhibited together. It's a diaristic practice as well. But all, all of this stuff really uh, stems from these early years. Uh, my, uh, when, when I arrived at uh, the Art Institute uh, in the late 80s, um, the, the professors that were um, dominating the school were the Chicago Imagists, and uh, many of which still are with us today um, and um, these, these include Jim Nutt and Barbara Rossi. Uh, I was really interested in uh, the imagist aesthetics and the way that they were using um, vernacular elements and uh, they were kind of like perhaps they seem to me more like these more like psychological answer to pop art uh, and they also encouraged us to um, to really look out there in the world and they just like take, take every every uh, every um, visual aspect that it was interesting to us and putting that, put them into, into our own work. Um, Barbara Rossi was particularly uh, an important uh, a prof teacher for me uh, and her drawing class was really influential uh, to me in, in the way that I, uh, she allowed me to, to, um, to explore images and then merge them. And I started thinking in terms not just of the visual element, but also in conceptually. And um, and another person that, that to me was particularly important, perhaps the most important of my years as a student was uh, Bob Lesher, uh, Robert Lesher. He was the art history professor uh, at their institute, one, one of the many art history professors, but he was, he was really an institute. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you, Pablo. Oh, okay. Um, so I was speaking about um, Bob Lesher. He um, was an institution at their institute. He had um, been teaching there since the early 70s. Uh, he had been the editor of the arts of Encyclopedia Britannica, and he truly was like a mountain of knowledge. 
and his lectures were just incredible. And I, I really uh, was so interested in his, uh, in, in, I, was, I was completely captivated by his knowledge and uh, his erudition. And um, later I learned that he was a Latin Americanist. And uh, very shyly, I, I approached him one day and, and revealed that I was from Mexico. And he was so nice, nice and generous, and he, he wanted to see my work. And uh, he came to see my work, and that turned out to be the most important studio visit of my life. Um, I was very, very nervous uh, on that uh, day when he came to, to, uh, to a classroom where I had displayed my drawings. I was at that time working on, on a series of it was like a, an alphabet of gardens uh, in which each letter contained a garden, this letter D. Uh, I was working on those with Barbara Rossi, and I had been making some paintings and I was showing him, I was showing, I showed him some of the paintings and I showed him these drawings. And Bob's response uh, was kind of um, both uh, disappointing and prophetic to me. Because the first thing he told me is like, uh, that I was not a painter, which of course really like, uh, you know, really broke my heart. He told me like, you're not a painter. And I just couldn't believe he was saying that. And then he said, um, you will be doing performance you will be doing time arts and at that time I was not in the least interested in performance art I was just I didn't think about that was at all but he was completely right he he uh, he detected that my work was sequential and the, it, the sequentiality in the work uh, definitely later manifests in, in, in performance and he also made another observation he he we spoke about immigration we spoke about my trying to find uh, myself in the in the in the United States, and he reflected on how I felt my, that I felt freedom within structure, and that those those letters represented the structures within which I wanted to find that freedom. Those gardens were my freedom, and he told me like you are the boy inside the letter, which uh, of course led to the novel. Uh, it's of course you know like shortly after I was doing performance and it was fast I became obsessed with performance art I was I I, I took over um, the performance space and I was performing there all the time and my my graduation project uh, was uh, indeed a performance um, and then um, many years later um, comes the the um, the another moment of, of uh, re reckoning or thinking about this past. And here I'm going to stop sharing. I, um, many years later, I uh, went back to Chicago. I moved to New York. I went back to Chicago. I was helping my mom move. And uh, this was back in 2007. And then I discovered a series of diaries that I had kept uh, throughout my whole uh, school year, my, 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 sorry, my art school years. And, um, and they were uh, written to me in the future. So I was, I was like reading a letter from someone who I had forgotten had written to the future me. And um, I decided to develop a, uh, a project that they can call the, the boy inside the letter that was also an exhibition of many of the objects that I showed, of some of the works that I showed and um, not presented as an art as artworks but more as artifacts as the uh the indicators of a uh, like an ancient uh civilization perhaps you know so, so i was not interested so much in them as in their value in their aesthetic value but it's more in what they told the story that they told and what i'm going to do now is i'm going to read a, a, a section from the boy inside the letter <clears throat> um and it is the, the la this is around four minutes, and it's like uh, the, the end of the introduction. This is the section where I, I'm talking about the, the objects that I'm finding in these boxes. So here we go. And now it is your turn to go to the basement and empty it out. It's always dark in there, like a Midwestern catacomb. You pass through the giant fermented beer containers of Mr. Bum, the German landlord and the many piles of antlers from his hunting forays in Wyoming. There is always a pervasive smell of raw bratwurst. Miraculously, the old Super 8 film projector is still there. You find the old easel from the times of painting landscapes in Gompers Park. Way at the back of the humid basement, behind the wooden door in the corner, there they are, 
a number of boxes, and one in particular you're very familiar with, which has a faded name on it, Phoenix Abraxas, and which later your sister Maruca marked on top as Papeles Pablo, when she reorganized the basement a decade ago. You undergo indescribable feelings as you start digging through your very own small biographical Tutankhamen tomb. Unwrapping that bristly, moss-covered brown paper that envelops some of those remote artifacts that you both awaited and dreaded to open one day. Diaries, letters, drawings, notes, tickets to the opera, rail maps, foreign currency coins, old erasers, a glue stick, all of which feel as if they had been made or owned by another person, and yet who is way too familiar for you to set apart from yourself. Most important are the diaries which even before you open them, you already know that they are filled with, with that handwriting tilted to the right that is so precise that it makes you realize that you have been writing on a computer for so long that you are incapable to handwrite legibly anymore. And you know very well that those diaries are addressed specifically to you, to yourself living in your present, to yourself who at the time when the diaries were written didn't exist yet, another person of you who paradoxically was younger than you are now, but at the same time was also older since he lived in earlier times than the ones you are living. He had the hope that you would open these diaries and read them with the anxiety of that age that made him feel in the deepest isolation and solitude, feeling misunderstood by everyone. And that strange decision of his that the only person who would understand him, the one who could possibly translate him to others, who could be sympathetic to his ordeal without judging him, would be his own supposedly mature self when you be, will become the judge of his adolescent experiences. You admit that you are embarrassed about him and had chosen to keep him in the back of your mind, enclosed in that basement, like most people do with their younger selves, glad that he has almost vanished completely in the tunnel of oblivion. You always had nothing but derision towards those who try to relive their youthful moments through high school re reunions and to those who arrive at a midlife crisis stereotypically searching on the internet for their old classmates at the wee hours of the night. You would like to be like any other of those artists who eventually destroy the creative attempts of their youth, as if they wanted to ensure that no one may know what they were once, that they were once young and naive and clueless about the world. But you could never do that. Who knows why? Maybe due to sentimental attachment to your preternatural congenital obsession with the past, because you want to prove to yourself that those years had some coherent meaning after all, or maybe because you know you will not be honest with him, nor with yourself, nor with all of us, because some remnants of who we were at that point persists in us, like stubborn traits that refuse to leave us altogether. In looking at those drawings, you think that adolescence might prepare us for adulthood, but nothing truly prepares us for adolescence because childhood is a playground of its own. And you admit that he deserves the benefit of the doubt and the second chance to speak that he requested you to facilitate, because at the end of the day, you are indebted to the fact that he suffered so that you could go on to become whoever you became, for better or worse. He never asked anything of you other than making sure he will be listened to one day, and there is no doubt that that day is now. As you are sitting in that dark basement, in this West Rogers Park house where he once lived, you start reading with skepticism, but gradually develop empathy and his strange and somehow silly responsibility, but responsibility nonetheless, that starts becoming more and more tangible as you traverse through those hundreds of pages. You decide that you will write about what he lived, but also allow those diary entries to be read exactly as they were written, and you will only change a few names of some of the persons described in those pages so that they, wherever they might be now in the world, may be spared from any embarrassment should they happen to read these pages. Predictably, the writing is clumsy and shamelessly romantic, but we all knew that, including him, and you hope that those who read this may understand. Slowly, as in those family movie night sessions, when you would dim the lights and set the projector in motion, the clicking engine starts its evocative sound speeding up, the projected light falls onto the screen, showing the clock-like wipe of the decreasing numbers. The smells and the colors subtly turn back on your minds. The subtle internal circuits in your brain are triggered by those small madeline crumbles of thoughts 
and events that he described each day with great precision on thick, humid summer days and bleak winter nights, obedient to the single rule that he had imposed to himself and never broke, that whatever the circumstances, he would always write without scratching a single line and telling things exactly as they were happening and crossing in his mind, without any embarrassment, sending fear, modesty, and humility to hell, because only by writing truthfully could he aspire to be truthfully absolved. So that's the introduction of the novel. <clears throat> and what we'll see now is the, um, the video, Evanston, November 10th, uh, 1989, which references uh, my first um, two months uh, being in Chicago and uh, my uh, traveling to Evanston to, uh, to look for used uh, books and going to the public library and uh, and uh, on a particular day that I uh, never forgotten, which was the day after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which I got on the bus reading the paper about those news and the thoughts that were running in my head at the time. So, uh, Unique, if you want to play the video, then we can talk afterwards. opens our eyes and opens our minds. What they don't say is that displacement after the tourist aura dissipates and turns into yearning makes us see the absence of home into all things. When we close our eyes to see only our memories, do we close instead our eyes to ourselves? Are memories only a form of tourism we practice to get away from the present? Many times we don't understand the meaning of that displacement based on this person that I am observing me being in that past. I don't understand it at the moment. I only sense it. I think I am lost right now, walking around these streets on November 10th, 1989. The light is bright, but I feel I am in the dark. I see the world, as my brother would say, like from the eyes of a dog, in a metaphorical silence. I hear the noises, I see images, but I don't comprehend them. It is getting cold. It is a November day in Chicago, with the crisp leaves floating around. I am still fascinated and alienated by the American urban landscape. I feel I still don't know what it's all about. I have a wrinkled map in my hand, but I can't find the streets I am on. I feel if I continue straight, I will finally arrive to a recognizable avenue. I miss my friends. I have a great desire to create new friendships here, but it doesn't come easily. My English is too defective and I am unable to understand body language, subtle references. I ask myself if I have made a mistake. Perhaps I do not belong in an art school. I want to learn philosophy, humanities. I don't want to get my hands dirty with oil paint. I do not want to smell a turpentine every day. I often close the eyes under the winter heating lamps of the L train in the waiting booths and my imagining that I am sitting at the fountain of the school with the bright and warm 2 p.m. sun. In Mexico, I used to read 19th century novels and place myself in remote environments, Wuthering Heights, the Middle Ages, Egypt. Now I am in a remote location and I instead want to be in Mexico. In my desire to be in a place that feels both familiar and foreign, I want to be in Spain, which up to that moment I have not yet visited. Spain to me is another fictional land, a picturesque environment depicted in novels, operas and plays like Don Quixote, Carmen and Don Juan Tenorio, which I obsessively recite from the heart. I often think of my smelling the chimney smoke of the church next door and my observing the light within its windows. 
and wanting it to be a portal to Spain. I think of a song from El Cancionero de Uppsala, a book of 16th century Spanish music discovered in Sweden. As the night is dark and the road so short, why don't you come, my friends? I find myself helpless. I carry a great passion within me. Oh, why don't you come, my friends? Smells. I smell the kimchi of the Korean restaurant next door on Lincoln Avenue. Light. I see the green and red light of the vacancy sign of the Apache Motel next to it. Smells. I smell the barbecue that reminds me of Salomon Nader's huge house and the parties he used to organize. Everyone would play soccer but me. Why do I miss something where I was excluded? I wait for the 49B bus on that day. I buy the Chicago Tribune, 25 cents in the corner, using the newspaper dispenser. Reading the paper, I learn that way that the Berlin Wall has fallen. I am fascinated by the events of those days. A momentous shift in our history, representing the end of a world order. But I am not there, where the important events are happening. I am on Western Avenue, in West Rogers Park. I feel like I am outside of placeness. I desperately try to find something to be somewhere, but I do not know what I am looking for. Look at me. There I am. I am walking around the campus of Northwestern University. I seem to believe that by walking around, by sitting in the student lounge, I will have the feeling that I am a student, that I will become a student as if wanting to be someone, as if performing that role, I might become that character. That by performing that way, I will somehow understand existentialist philosophy or the works of Bishop Berkeley or Henry Bergson and engage with contemporary thinking and the present. I am performing desires of knowledge. I am a performed desire of knowledge, but I can't do it. I do not become it. I am like a small child, unable to reach on the top counter where the cookie jar is located. I have an address for two used bookstores and a map with the streets of Evanston. The first bookstore is Bookman's Alley on Sherman Avenue. I have been to that bookstore once with my dad on the same day we had been to the movies to see a Woody Allen film. The owner Roger Carlson sits at the entrance, always talking to a visitor. His desk is surrounded by mountains of books. The bookstore looks like a mix between a giant, sprawling living room and an elaborate set of a theatrical production. Each room appears to have different decorations, none of them really relating to the categories of the books on display. One of the rooms seems like a patriotic collection of Americana. Another has Native American textiles and objects. I gravitate toward the back of the bookstore, where there is a poetry and philosophy section. I find T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, the thin gray book edition. I see the essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. I think of my uncle Eduardo, the poet, on our visits to his house. Like the house of most Mexican intellectuals, it was overflooded with books. It felt like some kind of paradise to me. This bookstore reminds me of those kinds of places. I even notice the distant smell of cigar smoke. There's a chessboard lying there. The music playing in the background is probably Billy Holiday. The lamps give everything a warm, yellowing glow. I am still lost, but I kind of feel I am at home. The present seems to be here. Or is that how I feel? I really can't explain how I feel. If pressed, I would probably say that I no longer have a home. I would like to be the prodigal son, but a classmate the other day had told me, you will never return. 
Because I do not hope to turn again. Because I do not hope. Because I do not hope to turn. I forcefully reject that idea. Of course I will return. I say, I will be back home. This is only a dream, and I will return to the original smells, the original textures, the fabric of where I have come from. I will awaken. But I am not convinced of what I'm saying. The truth is that I don't know anything. The truth is that I am scared. I am scared of heavy metal. I am scared of the night. I am scared of the American English language. I was mugged on my first day of school in Chicago. They had sensed my fear. I feel I need to be at the center of things, but I am instead in a known place. I go to see beautiful university gardens to see if I can be at the center of knowledge. I go to the bookstore to see if I can be at the center of a conversation. But instead I find yellowed pages of books that no one reads anymore. Instead I am in a conversation with the ghost of my grandfather. My grandfather who, by the way, was a businessman. My grandfather who, by the way, thought he was a writer. My grandfather who wrote novels that he self-published and that no one ever read. Novels that my uncle used to keep the fireplace going decades later, until they were all gone. I asked myself if I might one day end up like that, as that yellowed book, as a painting thrown into the fireplace by uninterested grandchildren. But then I say to myself, this is why art is made. We make it to preserve things from dying, to capture time. Even the unimportant moments, the most unimportant things. We are there to prevent the extinction of objects. We are here to commemorate them. And this is what I want to do. I want to preserve that light and that smell. I want them to become real. I want to turn that projected shadow in that building into a permanently commemorated event. I want to turn the Saturday morning spring rain into a permanent medieval garden. I want that warm light to be permanently the embrace of youth. Roger Carlson, Eduardo, chess players, Billy Holiday, Charles Lamb, my grandfather, T.S. Eliot, heavy metal, kimchi, Uppsala, the Berlin Wall, the dry leaves, everyone and nowhere, Sherman Avenue, you will never return, the Berlin Wall, Sor Juana, Charles Lamb, Woody Allen, Chicago Tribune, Western Avenue, 49B bus, the novels, the fireplace. I am waiting for the bus. These days it gets dark already by 4 p.m. I go home with three books under my arm. One has the ideas of an existential philosopher who I fear has been forgotten, but who I hope is still discussed in the cafes in Paris. The other is a Renaissance play that I'm imagining is being performed somewhere in the world at this very moment. And the other is a dog-eared book of poetry by a poet that I want to be the only one who knows it, the only one who reads it. I could be wrong, and I am surprised to think this, but I wish I was that book, laying in a bookshelf of a used bookstore, waiting to be read and discovered and shared with others on a sunny, bright morning. Okay, let's go to the conversation. Daniel. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, there was a moment where I couldn't mute myself. So, um, it's hard to choose where to start because what you've given us is very rich particularly, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I'm an art historian, I can't help it. Um, 
I, I, there's so many dates in play, but maybe one of the ones that I'm not sure we, you mentioned would be 2008, which is actually the date of Boy Inside the Letter. Already that's more than 10 years ago, right? So to me that, that matters. Um, and it's, it sort of forms the, 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 my first question. Um, there's, the, there's a line about Madeleine crumbs in Boy Inside the Letter, which for me is a reference to Proust and to one of many uh, literary genres that, that you seem to be invoking um, in making choices of how to, how to organize um, diary entries from when you're an art student, when you've recently changed countries, come to Chicago from Mexico City. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about doing this kind of work now. So it's one thing to do it in 2008, and it's another to do it in 2021. Um, you, you use the term um, vacation, I think, you know, that, that delving into memory, um, communing as it were with your with this these this earlier self almost like a kind of um i don't know uh vacation from <laughs> the present and and i'm just curious about that aspect to start us off you know in a way to start in the in the present um what are the the stakes or the 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 temptations uh, um, in 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 delving into the self in a moment of uh, isolation, the, the the moment of of intellectual isolation that we're that we're all living in. Um, okay, so um, where to start? Um, well, first, thank you for noting the dates. Um, <clears throat> just to provide a little context about the genesis for this project, um, right before. Um, I started this project, I had completed what had been a life-changing project, which was the School of Pan American Unrest. It was a gigantic journey, a very public performative event that involved me collaborating with hundreds of people, uh, traversing 20-something uh, countries, um, and, and basically uh, doing what I guess later we would call social practice, uh, a, a kind of like a, a first attempt at understanding what that actually meant. Um, this um, comes after that, and in a certain way, um, and I was I did not really think about it. I, I did not really have to think about it at the time, but in, in the end, it, it became like a really necessary exploration for me, which in a way was like a, a similar gigantic journey, but it was instead a journey of the of my past of the interior. It was it was a similarly ambitious, but it was not it was not about driving in the, in the highway. It was about like mentally driving through the pages and pages of these kids diaries, which is my diaries. Um, and also it was perhaps a way to come to terms with my literary self or my literary aspiration, which, I, which was very different from the visual artist self that I had developed over the years. Uh, and there is a, uh, an element from in, in the novel, which, is not, which I did not address earlier, but it's um, in, in the novel, there's, there's, a, there's the, these, uh, um, story about the cicadas that, that I actually find at some point in, in 1989. As some of you might know, cicadas are these um, insects that uh, every 17 years or so they re-emerge. And I believe this year they might actually be re-emerging, if I'm not mistaken. The fact of the matter is that the, the 17 year, year cicadas that I actually had actually found or remember writing about in my diaries actually re-emerged. Um, when I was actually writing the novel. And I was not thinking about that at all until like one day I was at my mom's house in, in Arlington Heights, you know, and suddenly there was like, this, like, we heard the cicadas and one of them was on the, on the, on the, 
on the windowsill and um and that's when it hit me you know like there's this cyclical kind of a, con a connection in our in our bodies in our minds in our brains you know and and uh i wanted to like uh make a gesture to that cyclical temporality i feel that i'm that i'm reaching out again <laughs> that that cycle and it, i don't know what it why is it but uh it's you know, like you, you become re introspective, retrospective at, at certain moments in your life. I, I am going to turn 50 this month. So perhaps that is the reason. I'm not sure. But, um, but every time I go back to Chicago, I mean, it, it's, it's a really uh, a special experience. And, and, and I encounter this past as well. You know, and like it makes me reflect on that. Um, so I don't know, like, that's why the novel and the dates are so important. And, and uh, the, in, the, in the same way that the reference to Proust is, of course, I mean, it's the, the diaries become the Madeleine, right? They, they become the, uh, the little like crumb that suddenly you see, which opens a portal to everything else, you know, to, to, a, to, a, to a past that you had uh, previously forgotten. And I don't know, because I have done so much work about memory or, or the past, I mean, like, I've been obviously always been obsessed with the role that memory plays in our um, in our lives, you know, it, 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 I, I am very interested in nostalgia, and I don't see it in a in a in a negative way as many people see it. I mean, I feel there's there's a lot of writings in, in fact about how nostalgia um, is is a, a feeling that is a melancholic feeling that um, that nonetheless allows you to value things to to rethink and, re, and and restore yourself and and allow you to reestablish your identity that is perhaps how i related to the notion of vacation the fact that you know like that you that it is important to have some some part of your mind that goes there every now and then uh, because those small vacations of the self allow you to perhaps uh restore your sense of self and restore your your sense of, of who you are. Sorry, I guess I shouldn't mute because it's uh, it's long. <laughs> um, I want to draw attention to the video and um, you know this experience of of reading uh, the boy in the letter to prepare for tonight, and and then watching this video, it's 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 humbling in a sense because I moved here from New York, and for a long time I think entertained the idea that I wasn't you know in Chicago, and then and and now you know I watch a video like that, and I'm like oh well that's not Chicago, you know um, the streets that I'm looking at. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but it, that's Evanston, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. That's Evanston. So I love this gesture that you're making uh, to make this reflection by showing us in a sense what, what was like a, a kind of fantasy space for your younger self. It was, this was the, the sort of um, like retracing perhaps these journeys to a different school that you weren't enrolled in to to try to access this intense desire for the ideal education. That's, that's one piece that I get from these, these recollections and in particular from the many diary entries that are included in Boy Inside the Letter um, that, you know, the, the, the intense ambition of an artist who's in training at that time and who wants so in, intensely to be part of the center and the and the event, you know, the most urgent events of the moment, right? So embodied by um, the Berlin Wall in 1989. Um, but I, yeah, I'm curious just about that choice in terms of um, this work that we all just uh, viewed. Um, it's a it's a very refined and I, I feel like straightforward choice to sort of advance through space with this um, incredibly complex layered uh, voiceover. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's obviously an autobiographical moment and like, you know, I think we all in our lives, perhaps when we think about our past, you know, we, there's moments that, that we hold on to, you know, and like, there are not necessarily the moments of like the most, like 
like big celebrations, you know, like birthdays or Christmas dinners or like things like that, but kind of like those random moments for me, at least, you know, that kind of represent everything, you know, and to me, right, r r wandering around Evanston in the fall of 1989 is one of those. Because I was kind of like, what the hell am I doing here? What, what, why am I doing, like, what, what's going on? <laughs> you know, like, what, what do I want to be? Like, why am I in Chicago? Why am I in, like, in this place? You know, what, what? I had so many different questions, you know. And, and I was in a mental state where um, some of my friends, uh, even high school friends, and in fact, one of them actually, is, is, I think, joined the, the, <laughs> the program. Uh, Jordi. Uh, they were in different American universities. One of them was in Brown. Another one was in MIT. Jordi was in MIT. And like, I remember like hearing how they were taking humanities and, and like uh, liberal arts. Like they, they were like learning a lot of different things. And I was like really disappointed with my choice of what I decided to do. Like I was learning how to like, you know, paint in oils, you know, and I just, I just felt like dissatisfied. You feel like I, I want to I want to study philosophy. I want to. I want to. I feel art is about ideas, and I need to learn those ideas, you know. But I felt that incapable to to do that. Thus, my um, very kind of uh, spontaneous like forays into like places to try to like see if I could learn something, perhaps. So uh, this this video is really about that moment that that and uh, this this sense that you. Which, which I think is the illustrative just of, of any artist, you know, at that age, you know, like you feel that you want to do something important, but you feel you're like nobody, that you're just completely in the margins, you know, and you see these important things happening and you want to be part of them, but you don't know how to do that. Um, I think it's, it's a lot about the, the desire of, of being an artist or, or like the, the impulse of, of wanting to make and be part of a conversation and the feeling that, that you... That, that you're not part of it and, and, and the, the fear that you might never be part of it, that you will always exist in those kind of like uh, unacknowledged margins. I'm also a big fan of this, what I see is this adaptation of the, um, the Bildungsroman or the Kunstlerroman, these uh, genres that some trace back to Goethe of how an artist's development is is narrated um, which presumes a lot right it, it presumes a sort of future point of maturity or a moment where everything comes together and the artist knows who they are and so on um, what are some ways that you've in a sense tried to play with or perhaps critique that uh, um, genre. So, well, it's interesting, you know, when I when I found the diaries, I <clears throat> and I started thinking about the idea of the novel, I, I realized that indeed the Constable Roman, or Constable Roman, or however you want to call it, uh, it's, it's a form that is typically produced around the age of when I produced when I made mine. In other words, like you are, you have arrived at an age where you are an adult, uh, you have not entered yet, like uh, old age. You are somewhere in your forties or late thirties or whatever, and you're not so far away from that youth, so that you can still connect to it in some degree, and not see from like some distant kind of like uh, past. But there, there's still some connections to it. But it hasn't really broke. Those links have not completely broken, complete totally. You know, so you can you can speak about it. So so I I, I felt that it was a moment to do it. Um, and my, um, my sense of the entire thing was that I, 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 I was very aware and also like, uh, talking to friends and others, uh, how as artists, we tend to hate our adolescence, but we always speak about it, like in a very kind of, uh, um, kind of embarrassingly, embarrassing way that, oh, that was embarrassing. It was terrible. I was an idiot, you know, I was like, I, I, I didn't know anything, you know, and, um, and these tendencies, yes, I, I mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the text that, you know, we tend to just be, artists destroy their, their early work because they, they're, they just don't think it's like, you know, um, exhibitable or like they don't want it to be part of, the, of, of history. 
and my feeling was that that it is important to embrace it you know like when i read those diaries and i saw those drawings it's not that i feel proud of the of the artistry in those drawings i i wanted to um to show that warts and all with intention not to to like um act as if it was like great artworks but more as i said to, to give it some sort of anthropological look at what is really that life of the artist as an adolescent because they the writings the diaries um what they communicated to me was what they reminded me of was the incredible um passion and 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 uh the, the very very strong feelings that motivated them uh, those writings so uh, and i wanted to acknowledge that that those those things are are important and um so I don't know. As an educator, you know, I think you, we are trained to value the views of everyone, you know, regardless of their age, you know. And uh, education is very like a uh, modern education is is very focused on how even children, you know, like uh, they should be treated like like uh, decent human beings and like you know with decency and humanity, understanding that perhaps their brains might not be developed, developed fully developed as a hu as an adult. But that doesn't mean that that doesn't make them less human. You know that it's important to recognize the the creativity, the humanity, the inventiveness, the, the and the feelings of that person. You know, and all these things were in my mind when I was reading those diaries as well. You know, and I, so the, you know, in a certain way, that that project was a little bit, if it was a critique of any way, it was a critique of of our own conception as adults of of youth. You know, of adult of the, of our teenage years of, of adolescence, and this question on you know, who are we, who do we become thanks to that person that we were once? You know, how are the experiences that that young person had um, eventually lend or led to who we are today? So anyway, those are sort of things that were in my mind. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, one thing I certainly appreciate is this idea that that no affects are embarrassing and that um no no intensities of emotion are embarrassing they're all of value they're all a component of being a young artist and of learning right and um to own them and to include them to uh really gives a, a rich sense of that younger artist's voice indeed in the uh text you uh make a point of splitting self in a way uh temporarily between a um a you and a him who uh, one of whom the, the you situated in the present the him situated in the past um i think is a very elegant way to think about temporal displacement between earlier versions of ourselves but also the way that that earlier person can look to a future self it's not merely a looking back it's almost like a kind of a mutuality but the thing we haven't discussed yet is geographical displacement and um, the boy in the letter. And in, I think in some ways, um, this video that we just watched are also about this experience of transitioning um, between cultures, um, moving from Mexico to the United States. And a phenomenon that I think is not commented on enough, uh, perhaps because I'm directly involved in it, but the fact that um, many Latin American uh, artists have, um, over the past 20, 30 years, have uh, trained in the U.S. at U.S. art schools, have, in, have um, intersected with our extremely challenged and probably problematic model of private arts education here. Um, but nonetheless, this is the case, right? There's a, there's a kind of um, existing community uh, of, of artists who have experienced this this same kind of displacement. I'm wondering if you feel there are aspects of your experience that are in a sense um, generalizable if 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 in a way you're 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 speaking for others as well as uh, yourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, um, first, you know, just just to mention that this this whole like uh, formula of you and him and which I, I definitely employed, which refer which refers to like you as the person in the present and him in the, in the present in the past etc it's a direct reference to carlos fuentes 
uh, who uses that strategy in the death of Artemio Cruz, you know, the, 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 the death of Artemio Cruz, uh, La Muerte de Artemio Cruz, like a famous Mexican novel. I mean, he, he uses it not, not to, to uh, do a self-reflection, but he to refer to this character in different moments of his life, you know. Uh, so it was that, just to mention that it was kind of like a reference, and, and I just felt it was like a necessary mechanism to really like uh, establish like those the, the what was that who's speaking, you know, and and to whom that person is speaking, and it becomes really complicated because there is like me in the past speaking to me in the present, right, and uh, and then there's also me um, thinking about the other person. It, it, just, it just becomes like a very quickly like a cast of characters, <laughs> you know. Um, what else? Then, in terms of the of the geographical experience, um, uh, and um, I I felt, and I think that many of my colleagues that were with me, especially from Latin America, you know, uh, we 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 formed a very close uh, community, like a strong bonds, and we we felt that we could not really quite fit in because with with the latino community for example because we were we have been born and raised in latin america and we were and i didn't know it at the time something that is later or has been termed generation 1.5 which is a i think a korean term for those individuals who were born in a particular place and are, they emigrated when they are teenagers uh, which means that you are first generation but you arrive to the other country, to the new country, uh, when already a, a significant part of who you are is already established. Like I already, you know, spoke Spanish. I already had like a certain like a set of experiences, you know. And um, so, so I was not a child. You know, I was already almost becoming an adult when I come to to Chicago at, at eighteen years of age. So I was like a, a generation one point five, and that that um, that fact makes it in a way even stranger because you are the disadvantages are that you never really quite belong to anywhere else specifically like you never I, I i never became mexican in the sense that you know i would have become if i had stayed in mexico but i will never be american because I, I came already somewhat you know somewhat cooked already so it, it's you 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 have this this thing that you can never be completely one thing but at the same time, you have the ability to really merge into those environments with much easier, well, in a, with greater ease that if you, that if I had been, for example, born from Mexican parents in the United States, right? Um, so it, but it, but you exist in this in this kind of in between place, and then, um, the, but what what's what's I think one of the reflections or perhaps one of the messages of the novel is that in the end that's what I'm, being an artist is You're forever in this uncomfortable place in this non place that we are never completely of one location of one context we are always an outsider to a certain degree and it's that uh, condition of being an outsider that uh, while at some times might feel like lonely or difficult, it does give you a perspective to to observe uh, the world and, and make it, make produce a work that 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 is a, the the result of that obs those observations, and in a way that that's kind of part of the job to always be outside. So I think this would be a great moment if there are questions uh, from. Everyone else who's here. We haven't received any questions yet, but um, I would love to invite everyone that feels comfortable to do so to turn um, the cameras on. And if you would like to also uh, put the gallery view so that we feel we are in the same room. And thank you so much, Pablo and Daniel, um, for your great presentation and conversation. And um, like I said, I'm happy to read any questions um, or if you would like to ask yourself, then please do so.
well, while we're waiting for one to, <laughs> to emerge, um, could I ask you to elaborate just a bit on the, the Sor Juana uh, reference that's in the video? Um, one thing that it links to is your experience. Um, I don't know if it was interning or working, working in a salaried capacity for the National Museum of Mexican Art, but I think that's a wonderful um, piece of this story of your, of your time in Chicago. Well, um, basically, um, my brother was a writer and he actually wrote, he worked for Octavio Paz, you know, the, who was the writer at Nobel Prize. And, and, um, and Paz was, of course, um, known or among many other things besides being a great poet, he, for being someone who writes this major volume of the work of Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. And, um, and I was from always very interested in, in Sor Juana's poetry and her you know, fascination with hermetism and, uh, and the kind of 17th century philosophy, like a um, esoteric philosophy that, uh, that she turns into poetry. So I, I was really drawn to, to that kind of era and that kind of like heavily metaphorical Baroque poetry that she was producing. And, and I kind of saw art that way, kind of like being like laden with very heavy symbols. So uh, that's why for me it was, was an, important, um, an important reference, you know, and, and I remember trying to illustrate uh, at the time, uh, one of uh, Sor Juana's, um, perhaps her, her great magnum opus, Primero Sueño, uh, which is uh, considered her, her most important and one of the densest uh, poems written in the Baroque period. It's a very, very long um, meta metaphysical poem about knowledge, about this idea that you have this dream where you know everything. You know, and it's, uh, I remember just doing these illustrations uh, about Primero Sueño and then destroying everything because they were terrible anyway. So just like, got rid of it. <laughs> it looks like we have a question from Victoria Martinez. So Victoria, you're welcome to ask. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, hello. And um, yeah, I just, I, I do have a question about nostalgia. I recently graduated um, from the painting program at Yale and I would reference nostalgia with a lot of my textile based work uh you know my question is for you um do you, like what book recommendations do you have in terms of nostalgia because it is um, something that i feel is frowned upon <laughs> um but I, yeah. I i i absolutely embrace it um yes i mean uh for many years it has been one of my like pet peeves you know to kind of like critique those who critique nostalgia <laughs> because of course in in our criticism and you will know this daniel like i think that it, in our criticism like when whenever you say something is nostalgic it's just like it's like the worst thing you can say about anybody's artwork because we we do and i do subscribe partially to this idea that you know like we are not here to just to repeat things that already existed you know it's it, it, like it's a very conservative and not, not not interesting activity you know to just like uh re Regurgitate, you know, stuff that already has been established and said. But to me, that's not what nostalgia is. Nostalgia is instead, I think, a very creative activity that is really a lot about uh, reimagining worlds uh, based on information that may or may not be directly uh, connected to your life experience. And I think uh, nostalgia plays, I think, a very critical role in the immigrant experience mm -hmm. because the moment that you leave your native country or the country of your ancestors, there's a process of nostalgia taking place in which you uh, you imagine or recreate that world based on what you feel that you know, what you know about it. And that recreation is an act of, of creativity that, gen that almost inevitably ends up becoming something else. So you are making an artwork out of your memories or your references of something, and then you make something new. Uh, so that, that, that I find really interesting. And to me, uh, a very important person to me in this uh, topic was someone who was a friend, in fact, of mine, who passed away recently. Her name was Svetlana Voim. She was a Russian um, uh, uh, scholar who, uh, from Harvard, and she wrote a, a really extraordinary book called The Future of Nostalgia. Oh, do you have it there? 
Oh yeah, okay. So it's it's a it's an incredible book. I highly recommend it. It was written in two thousand and one, uh, and it deals with um, primarily with the the Russians' uh, sense of self, the the in, in this this the, the way in which Russians uh, negotiate mm-hmm. the 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 memory of the Soviet uh, of Soviet Russia, you know today. So the, the complicated history of the communist past, essentially, you know, and and how it's just it's just something incredibly complex that it's just very hard to to simply look at in, in political terms. So so nostalgia is is uh, I think a really uh, important um, concept that that uh, that that has many different uh, angles to look at. Thank you. I'm, I feel like I'm waiting for a question from Mark Fisher that would be like a, a deep Chicago question that I wasn't able to ask. Uh, since, since when is Evanston part of Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> it's all I That's a good question. It's a good question. I, I enjoyed the talk very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I got nothing. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. The the I guess I'll, I'll I'll mention the unrequited part, you know, um, and it's it's um, and I think I've talked to Mark about this before, but I I am um, it it is interesting to for for me as as, as a Mexican artist, you know, that lived in Chicago, then suddenly to have moved to New York, and like there's it's it's a the relationship between New York and Chicago is is uh, complicated, right? Love hate relationship and, and it's it feels weird to actually have like left Chicago to be in New York and I, I always have the feeling that once you leave New York you, you know nobody wants nobody wants to in Chicago anymore you know and like uh, but but uh, my my experience in Chicago was uh, a lot about this yearning for for wanting something and and feeling that I wasn't able to to get it back and it was like not Chicago's fault it was just my own failure as a as a as a young artist thinking that I could just like like uh, love something and they will love me back you know and uh, and I think that's what that whole um, title is about Pablo I have a question about your um, recent or the the works you showed briefly the collage that you're making um, the, the have this sort of diary also diary form if you can um tell a little more about them yeah uh, thank you for bringing it up I, it's one, something i forgot to mention so one thing that that i always uh, this is something i didn't think about until much later um something that i always found really cool about the chicago imagist um, was the use of text in their works and uh and sometimes the absurdity of the text that it was often employed um like when you when you look at some of Jim Nutt's titles, you know they're sometimes really weird and and strange. And that, and I think they they had these. I think Roger Brown did that too. They would just grab uh, some some words or tags and they put them out there, um, which kind of had a pop art esque element to it of and a conceptual strategy element to it. Like you just like suck it in and then put it in there. And in a way that kind of became part of the strategy of the collages, because what what uh, I started doing, at least, and I started making them in Chicago one day that I was broke uh, and I was uh, I needed to make some like holiday gift for family and friends. I just went to a used bookstore. Uh, I I bought like uh, four books of a dollar each, and I started cutting them and just putting the illustrations or, or taking taking the illustrations of the books. They were textbooks. Uh, and then and, and cutting phrases from the books and titles and then and seeing how they would relate to one another and uh, and it was a, uh, a strategy that, that I feel kind of connects with that um, um, interest in text and incorporation of text and also a little bit kind of like a theatrical connection to it too like I um, I also did some theater in Chicago um, after I graduated from 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 art school, I, I was part of the Blue Rider Theater, which was on Halstead Street, and I wrote my first play, and like we performed it there. And I, 
one of the things that I started learning um, about uh, playwriting was that it, it, it's useful to just go into the bus and start listening to what people say and write it down. And then just you, you incorporate those phrases into your plays. It, it becomes like a very kind of natural, organic way of like learning how people speak. And co the, collage, the collages that I make are, are kind of, a, in a way, writing like a very long play. Like a, or, a, or maybe writing a long lecture that somebody's or playing or reading for many, many years. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have two questions. Uh, one from Lisa that says, Paula recently presented a video as part of one of the pandemic salons. It also was autobiographical and traced his experience having been sick with COVID. It strikes me that it seems strongly related to the Evanston video and the notion of various cells, almost as if we're the next in a series. And I wonder about that relationship. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is the piece that you're referencing, Lisa, but I, um, and, uh, last year, <clears throat> uh, I did a performance lecture online, which was entitled Free of All Ties. And what it was basically was a almost like a, like a museum style lecture of my mother's apartment in Chicago. It was as if my mother's apartment was a museum, and then I would just be giving you a tour, you know, of the whole thing, uh, using uh, my the old kind of museum educator like uh, language and demeanor and so forth. And my mom's apartment in Chicago, by the way, it's a, it's a really uh, I don't know, it's, it's a really Baroque place full of the objects of generations and generations of people that that she that my family brought in from Mexico. So it's, it's a very unusual environment. So the, that, that's what that piece was about. It was basically going through this apartment, and like discussing this family history, but without saying it's my family history, describing it like as some kind of like um, anonymous apartment. But it was really a piece about um, this um, this uh, irony, I guess, that now we were all on lockdown, and like, and basically our worlds had become reduced to our apartments, you know, or to our house. And that was that was the world we had to interact with, even if we connect with the rest of the world, still our physical, um, our physical reality was th that living environment. So it was kind of like a, like a like a project that was meant to address that sort of like uh, both the, the connecting with the world, but always from that very reduced uh, territory that is like or domestic environment. A question, oh, unless Lisa, you had something to add to other. No, okay. Um, Laura Caroline asks um, about this move from Chicago to New York. And if you felt that you had to move from Chicago in order to be accepted or recognized by the Chicago art community? Um, it was, uh, well, honestly, it, it, the, the whole reason I moved was because I got a job. And uh, I was, I, I, there was a job at the Guggenheim Museum, which I, I never even thought I would ever get, but it was a friend who had recommended me and I just went and, and took the job and it was, it was a good opportunity. Um, there was uh, a, I mean, at the moment, at the time, it was, I, I was working at the MCA uh, and uh, I had realized that a lot of the artists that I was like uh, interested in, and many of them were actually in New York and, and, um, and I was just interested in seeing them up close and, uh, and that's what, what happened, but it was, it was never really like, uh, a, a, like a decision that I needed to leave Chicago and, or that I, that I wanted to to achieve certain recognition. It, I, was, I was just attracted to certain ideas and cer certain practices. And like, uh, you know, life has a way of simply kind of like taking you around and, and it's just, uh, you, you just, and then you, you never know where you're gonna land. It's kind of unpredictable. And like, it's funny, like I never really even imagined that I would end up in Chicago in the first place. Uh, when I was in Mexico, I thought I was gonna move to Paris, you know, but, uh, but suddenly, you know, my, my sister who had married a Chicago and had told me like, oh, there's a school here and she, com she convinced me to, to, to go to Chicago and it was a, an amazing experience. But you know, I guess we, we're not, it, it's never really as, as well planned as one and hopes it to be, I guess. 
And if I may follow up that, because I you know that you work at the MCA and the Guggenheim, um, but I also know that you work for many years at MoMA and that you left recently. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about this very recent change of leaving the museum workforce and focusing on your art practice. So um, I always felt I was leading a secret life. You know, like I was the secretly an artist, but working in a museum, and uh, and I did that, and, and and I never actually intended to have a museum career. That was never part of my um, my thinking, or you know. But I simply landed on a job. My first museum job was an intern at the Art Institute. You know, helping uh, one of the curators of the uh, of Richard Townsend, who was the curator of Africa Oceania and the Americas, and then I ended up working at the Mexican Museum where indeed, you know, I was involved, Daniel, in the creation of the, of the Sor Juana festival, you know. Um, but again, it was never really my intention to become a museum person. And that somehow also took another life of its own. And, and what became interesting was that <coughs> it became my way of also, um, without realizing it, it, became my way of really understanding audiences much better. Uh, because uh, inside the museum, I was since I was not an artist, I, I, my ego had to be, you know, be left at the door, you know, and like I just had to be collaborative and like think about, focus on other people and not myself, and that turned out to be really beneficial. And I think I, it, it like in, in the, in the indirectly uh, started like influencing my my work as an artist, you know. So all those experiences were really uh, positive, but it did became really difficult to really be able to negotiate those two things eventually and especially at mama became harder and harder um, and i believe that entering into the world of social media was harder than ever because i realized that it was impossible to completely separate the two and and i felt it was really necessary to finally make that transition and now that i'm now, now that i'm teaching at a university is is much better because i feel like the relationship between being a, an artist and an educator is is much um is, is, a, is, a, is a much clearer uh relationship than being a being in a museum as uh as, as a programmer or somebody who generates programs and well being a, as well as being a practicing, a practicing practicing artist and one day i will perhaps write a book about that relationship but maybe not today we have one last question um which i think is a really Great question to end with today. And that's from Yolanda Sesta Cursac Montilla. And it says, is the idea of future place of longing in that direction important for you in writing and creating, specifically as someone embodying multiple traveled Western hemispheres? Can you can you repeat the question? Because I didn't hear yeah. the first. Is the idea of future place of longing in that direction important for you, Pablo, in writing and creating specifically as someone embodying multiple traveled Western hemispheres? The, the question is also in the chat. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And um, well, I think it's, it's a really excellent question. Um, I, again, this is perhaps the educator in me, and I guess it's it's hard to like get rid of the educator educator in me. Um, I believe that the process of knowing is is a is in itself a journey. You know, it's 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 a process of exploration and a journey. And to me, I it has always become really literal. Like I, if I if I want to if I want to learn something, if I, if, I, if I want to like understand something. I feel I need to travel to it. And this has, I think, uh, been the driving, literally, no pun intended, the driving force in a lot of my work. Like I, I one, one time I became obsessed with the Shakers, for example, uh, that, who lived in Maine. So I actually drove to Maine to meet them. You know, I felt it was important uh, uh, that it would just not be me um, perhaps thinking about them or reading about them, but that I actually needed to meet them in person. Like going to that place physically, that, that, um, that journey, that, that uh, pilgrimage, I guess, um, becomes perhaps, uh, I don't know, like, a, a, like making the, the, the search of knowledge real to me. And in many cases, I think it has become also part of the work, like it happened with the Pan-American 
the School of Pan American Unrest. It was to me, uh, that project didn't make any sense uh, to do like flying on a plane. Like it, it, I felt that if I was going to embrace the notion of Pan America, I had to to drive the entirety of the Pan American Highway. I, if I really needed to understand Canada, I needed to drive through the entirety of Canada. If I needed to understand Argentina, I needed to drive from the from the top to the to the bottom of Argentina and so forth. So, so to me, perhaps perhaps it connects with performance. And I know Yolanda, you're a, a, a performance person. Um, that I think um, the the actualization of knowledge, to me, is really physical, and perhaps the, the whole idea of wondering, and perhaps the the video of Evanston, me wandering around Evanston, is a little bit part of the same thing. Like that, that knowledge is a uh, is is a meandering. Daniel, Pablo, any final thoughts, comments? That's a sensational place to stop. Uh, Pablo, I'm really grateful to you for, for doing this program and, and for uh, being able to have this conversation. Um, I've thank learned a lot so about your practice, I think, from, the, from these origins. Thank, thank you so much. It was a pleasure and uh, truly a joy. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pablo and Daniel.